Welcome everybody. I am Michael Goldschmidt of the National Healthy Homes Partnership. I am pleased to be organizing your webinar today. This webinar is sponsored by HUD's Office of Lead Hazard Control in Healthy Homes, joined by other HUD program offices. We're also grateful for the participation of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Washington State Department of Health. This call is not intended for media. Media can direct their questions to media at cdc.gov. Today's webinar is multifamily developments in COVID-19. Our panelists are Dr. Amy Kirby, Christy Newhouse, and Nancy Bernard. Dr. Amy Kirby is an environmental microbiologist in the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at the CDC. She is currently deployed to the COVID-19 response as part of the Community Mitigation Task Force Water Sanitation and Hygiene Team. Christy Newhouse has been with HUD for nine years and is currently the acting director of the Assisted Housing Oversight Division within Multifamily Housing's Office of Asset Management and Portfolio Oversight, headquarters office at HUD. Nancy Bernard, MPH, REHS, CPSI, manages the Washington State Department of Health, Indoor Air Quality, and School Environmental Health and Safety Programs, providing technical assistance, resources, and training for local jurisdiction and K-12 school staff. We are pleased that you have all joined us for this event. This webinar will last approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end for questions. We will be recording this webinar and posting it on the HUD Office of Lead Hazard Control Healthy Homes website, hud.gov forward slash healthy homes, for your viewing later if you prefer. If you have questions before then, please feel free to post them in the questions window and we will try to answer as many as we have time for. So let me go ahead and uh, start the presenter. So Amy, you are up and ready to present. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, it is our pleasure to be here today to talk to you about um, some background on COVID-19 um, and our cleaning and disinfection recommendations from CDC. Uh, I am <clears throat> an environmental microbiologist with CDC, and since February, I've been part of the Community Intervention Task Force for the response, uh, specifically on the water sanitation and hygiene team. Oh, there we go. Um, I just want to confirm, you guys aren't seeing my go-to webinar. No, not at all. Thing. And, okay, great. Perfect. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm not obscuring my own slides. Okay, a uh, quick overview of what I want to talk to you about today. I'll give you a little background um, and update on the COVID-19 uh, outbreak um, and the symptoms you might expect uh, or that we're seeing um, with this disease. We'll talk a little bit about what you should do to protect yourself and others. Um, talk about face coverings and social distancing, um, and then we'll get into really the meat of what we wanted to talk about today, which is cleaning and disinfecting at home and cleaning and disinfecting of public spaces. And then I'll share some of our CDC resources that might be of use to this group. Okay, so the COVID-19 outbreak uh, started in <clears throat> December in Wuhan, China. And the first case was reported in the United States on January 21st, 2020. And this was a travel imported case from China. Um, this disease is caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. Um, so that's the virus, the disease is COVID-19. Um, as of yesterday, there were over a million cases, 1,122,486 cases um, and 65,735 deaths uh, confirmed in the United States to be due to this illness. Um, we have seen confirmed cases in all 50 states um, and seven of the US affiliated jurisdictions and territories. Um, the link on this page goes to our um, case update page and that is updated every day at 3 p.m. Uh, if you wanna see uh, up to date numbers. The uh, virus that causes COVID-19 is thought to spread mainly from person to person. Um, so it's between people who are in close contact with one another. And in this case, we define close contact as within six feet of each other. Um, and it's spread through respiratory droplets that are produced when an infected person coughs or sneezes or talks. Um, and those droplets uh, that come out of your mouth can land in the mouth or nose of people who are nearby um, and possibly be inhaled into the lungs. Um, those droplets are relatively large and gravity will pull them to the ground. 
Um, and so that's why we have this six feet barrier. That's as far, uh, about as far as they will go. Um, we also now have data suggesting that people without symptoms may be able to spread COVID-19. So they either haven't developed symptoms yet um, so we call those pre-symptomatic people, um, and they uh, are contagious during that period, or they may never um, develop symptoms. They may stay asymptomatic entirely, um, and there's some data that those folks can transmit the disease as well. Um, we also have evidence that people may be able to get COVID-19 by touching a surface or object that has the virus on it, and then touching their mouth or nose or eyes. So it goes from the, from the sick person onto a surface, and then from the surface onto a hand, to um, your eye, your nose, your mouth. Um, and we know this happens with other viruses like colds and, and flu. Um, and so we have good evidence that it's also happening with COVID as well. Um, and that's why we are really um, pushing uh, appropriate cleaning and disinfection, which is what we're gonna uh, talk about today. The symptoms and complications. Um, this has actually changed uh, this week, well, last week. Um, so the symptoms include um, cough, shortness of breath, fever, chills, headache, muscle pain, and sore throat, which we've known for a while. Um, but as of last week, we added um, a loss of taste or smell um, and repeated shaking with chills. Um, and the, the loss of taste or smell is new. So you'll suddenly not be able to taste or smell anything. Um, this is not if you always had a, a loss of taste or smell. And it can be any of those symptoms. People have um, all sorts of different combinations. Uh, the disease that is caused can be completely asymptomatic. It can be mild. Um, many people are able to stay home um, and get through it like you would with the flu, but it can also be very severe, um, result in, uh, of course, people going to the emergency room, ending up in intensive care, and uh, sadly, even death. The incubation period for this disease, so the time between when you're infected and when you get sick, uh, ranges from two days to 14 days. So a lot of our um, uh, recommendations around quarantine are based on that 14 day period. So we want you to get through the incubation period and know that you're still healthy. Um, and the complications of this disease are of course pneumonia, um, and that pneumonia can lead to respiratory failure and multi-system organ failure. The link down there in the bottom that says symptom self checker, and we can provide these slides afterwards. So there is a link behind that. Um, actually goes to a, a self checker on our website. So if you if you're feeling ill and you're thinking, gee, I wonder if this is COVID, should I go to the doctor? You can go to the symptom self checker and check off the symptoms that you're having, and it will tell you whether or not that is consistent with COVID and whether or not you should call your doctor. So how can you protect yourself from this? Um, the really the best protection is good respiratory and hand hygiene. Um, and what do we mean by that? So that means avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Um, again, remember that's how it's going to get from a surface um, and cause an infection. Uh, you want to avoid close contact with people when you're not at home. So whether you're in a public space or a private space that's not your home, so you know someone else's house or something like that, um, you want to maintain that six foot barrier as much as possible. It is really important to wash your hands um, frequently with soap and water. You want to wash for at least 20 seconds or two times through the happy birthday song. Um, if you cannot wash with soap and water, you can use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Um, but we really would prefer you wash with soap and water. Um, that is the, the best approach. Um, and you want to clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces. I'm not going to talk about that a lot right now because we're going to talk about that more at the end. And so what can you do to protect other people? Um, so the very best thing is if you are feeling sick, please stay home. <laughs> Even if you think it might be allergies or maybe it's just a cold, um, it's really best now to just stay home um, and avoid uh, risking infecting someone else. Um, if you cough or sneeze, um, please cover that with a tissue. Or if you don't have a tissue, um, you can cough into the inside of your elbow. Um, and used tissues should be thrown away and wash your hands after that because you may have contaminated your hands. Um, this is what we call respiratory hygiene. So when we say practice good respiratory hygiene, this is what we mean. Um, again, avoid close contact with people when you're not at home. You may be infected and not know. So it's important that you um, keep your distance from other people so that you are not um, that person who's transmitting and uh, unknowingly. And part of that is wearing a cloth face covering that covers your nose and mouth um, when you're in public, uh, especially in situations where you may be near people. So think of going 
to like the grocery store. So even if you're not in a big crowd, you may pass by someone close um, in the like in the aisles. Um, and that's where we would want you wearing a cloth face covering. Um, and it's important to note that cloth face coverings are not a substitute for social distancing. So, you know, don't go have a party, but have everybody have a mask on. Um, we really want these things donation. You should still try and stay six feet away. Um, it's also worth noting that face coverings are not a substitute for PPE. Um, if you need personal protective equipment for the job that you're doing, you should wear that um, and not a mask. Um, cloth face coverings are to protect other people. What do you do if you're sick? Um, again, stay home. Um, most people will be fine um, recovering at home with just, um, you know, lots of fluids and rest. Um, stay away from people as much as possible, including the people that you live with. You don't want to get them sick. Um, while you're at home, this is the one exception to wearing a cloth face cover at home. If you are sick and living with other people, you should wear a cloth face cover when you're around um, the people you live with. For instance, when they're coming in to take care of you or when you're having to go out to the kitchen, um, you want to wear a cloth face covering then. Um, cover your coughs and sneezes and wash your hands. Um, wash your hands frequently, um, whether you cough or sneeze or not. Um, it's just always good practice to wash your hands often. Uh, avoid sharing personal household items. So think of all those things that everyone in your house touches, the remote control, the light switches, the doorknobs. Um, try and limit touching those things as much as possible so that um, they're not something that allows you to transmit the virus to the people you live with. Um, and of course, clean and disinfect um, those objects frequently um, if you are sharing them. So what should you do if your symptoms get worse? Um, it's really important if you are feeling sick to monitor your symptoms for the emergency warning signs, which include trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in your chest, um, any new confusion or inability to rouse, um, or bluish lips, which can all be signs of um, poor ventilation. If any of those things happen, um, please call uh, if you, if it's an emergency, call 911 and tell them you have a medical emergency. If it's not an emergency and you're just feeling worse, you can call your doctor. Um, in either case, please call ahead and tell them that you think you might have COVID. Um, you want them to be prepared um, to appropriately uh, handle you when you get to the doctor so that you're not uh, unnecessarily exposing people at the doctor or the hospital. Um, and either way, put on a cloth face covering before help arrives um, so that you're not uh, unintentionally risking transmitting to those uh, helpers. If you are able uh, to weather COVID at home, um, how do you know when you can go back out? Um, and this is what you need to know. So if you do get a test and you test positive, then you have to have no fever um, without fever reducing medicine and your other symptoms have to have improved and you have to test negative twice in a row and those tests have to be at least 24 hours apart. If you did not have a COVID test, so you're at home, you have all the symptoms, your doctor thinks you have COVID, but you never got tested. You need to have no fever for 72 hours, so three days without fever reducing medicine, and your other symptoms have to have improved, and it has to have been 10 days since you first got sick. So if you're only sick for a very short amount of time, a couple of days, you might have to wait longer before you can go um, leave your home. And if you had a positive COVID test, but you never had any symptoms, so you're one of those asymptomatic people, it needs to have been seven days since your positive test, the day you got that test, not the day you got the result, um, and you had to have no symptoms during that time, so you remained asymptomatic um, during those seven days. Again, social distancing is really, um, along with hand washing, one of the most important tools we have for slowing the spread of COVID-19. Um, again, the key there is six feet. We want you to stay at least six feet from other people. Um, don't gather in big groups. Stay out of crowded places and avoid mass gatherings. Um, the definition of a mass gathering varies from state to state, um, how they define that. So check with your uh, state and local authorities to, to know what they consider a mass gathering. And when you are in public, wear a cloth face, cloth face covering um, to protect other people, especially in situations where you may be um, near people, uh, even if only for a few minutes as you're walking. A few do's and don'ts about cloth face coverings. We want to make sure you can breathe um, easily, so it should not obstruct your breathing. You want to be able to wear it um, whenever you're going out. Make sure it covers your nose and your mouth and comes under your chin and should sit tightly on the side of your face. 
Um, and you want to wash it after you're using it um, so that it's not getting contaminated. Um, we don't want to put cloth face coverings on children under two or anyone that's incapacitated and may not be able to remove it uh, if they start having trouble breathing. Um, it's also worth noting that we are not recommending that you use surgical masks in place of a cloth face covering. Those surgical masks have um, explicit purposes for healthcare workers, and we want to reserve those for healthcare workers. Um, any cloth, cloth face covering that meets these requirements um, will work uh, for wearing a cloth face cover out in public. Okay, so now let's turn and talk about cleaning and disinfection. So we'll start first by talking about how to clean and disinfect your home, and then we'll talk more broadly about public spaces. Um, so the good news for COVID-19 is that the virus is actually pretty easy to kill. Most common household cleaners and disinfectants are effective against this virus. Um, so in all uh, likelihood, people at home don't need to rush out and buy a new disinfectant. Um, we do want people to be very careful to follow label instructions, use the appropriate dilution, um, allow it to sit on the contact on the surface for the amount of time that's indicated in the instructions. We call that contact time. Um, and use appropriate protective equipment. So if the label instructions say wear gloves, wear gloves when you clean with them. Um, this is not a case where if a little is good, more is better. Um, the amount that we're recommending that you use is perfectly sufficient um, to kill this virus. You do not need to use more, and it can be dangerous if you do use more. Um, so please follow the label instructions. If you cannot get um, any of these uh, labeled disinfectants, household bleach can be diluted. Um, and for COVID, uh, the dilution is a third of a cup of bleach into a gallon uh, of cool water. Um, it does not need to be hot water. Cool water is just fine. And then that can be used uh, to disinfect surfaces. You do not need to disinfect your home from ceiling to floor and all of the walls. Uh, we really want to encourage people to focus on high touch surfaces. So again, think of those things that multiple people are handling and sharing, things like remote controls, phones, toilet handles, light switches, doorknobs. Those are the places where you want to disinfect. It's more important to disinfect those high touch shared objects frequently, more frequently than to disinfect everything less frequently. And importantly, if those surfaces are dirty, you need to clean them first before you disinfect. Um, the disinfectant will not work as well, um, or perhaps not at all, if the surfaces are very dirty. If someone in your house is sick, so what I just went through is just your general cleaning and disinfecting for your house um, when everyone is well. If someone in your house is sick, you want to take some extra steps um, around cleaning and disinfection. If it's possible, the person who's sick should stay in a separate room from everybody else. Um, so that you are isolating them from the rest of the people in the in the house. Um, so set up a sick room. Um, if it's possible, a sick bathroom is really great too. So that person has their own dedicated bathroom. Um, and that way the sick person is not potentially spreading the virus into other areas of the house. Um, if they can have a dedicated sick room or sick bathroom, those spaces should only be cleaned and disinfected as needed. So you don't wanna go in there every day and expose yourself to that sick person. You only want to go in and clean if there's a really big mess that needs to be cleaned up. Otherwise, just let them be sick, keep the virus in the room with them, um, and you do not need to go in and clean. Um, if they're sharing a bathroom and it's shared, then you want to clean that um, and disinfect uh, frequently uh, during the day. The sick person should wear a cloth face covering when a caregiver is in the room. So again, you want to protect um, that sick person from giving the virus uh, to the healthy person, and that's what cloth face coverings are for. Um, after the sick person has recovered, close off your sick room, and, and they've met all of those criteria for leaving home isolation. So they felt better for 72 hours, and everything has improved, um, and it's been at least 10 days. After they've recovered, close off the sick room, if you can, open outside windows and doors and wait up to 24 hours to allow the room to air out. Um, so hopefully the virus will, um, some of it will leave through the air changes and then you can go in and clean and disinfect. So again, um, trying to protect the person that's doing the cleaning uh, as much as possible. Okay, so we're gonna take those same principles and apply them in public spaces. 
So the three things you want to remember when you're thinking about cleaning public shared spaces for COVID is you want your cleaning to be effective, you want it to be efficient, and you want it to be safe. So let's talk about what those three things mean. So cleaning and disinfection should be effective. And what we mean by that is you want to use the right chemicals. So you want to use chemicals that are listed on uh, the EPA list in. So this is a list of disinfectants that they have approved to be effective against uh, the virus that causes COVID-19. It's hyperlinked there. Again, we can provide these slides so you can have that link. Um, any disinfectant is going to be less effective if, if the surface is dirty. So you need to clean your surfaces first and then disinfect, um, especially if they're visibly dirty. Follow all of the main instructions. So you application method that is um, for that. Of uh, other methods, um, but you do want to stick to what to have the appropriate to be on the surface for wet for a minute, rinse it, or whatever the appropriate application is. Uh, if list in disinfectants aren't available, again, you can dilute household bleach, um, and it would be the third of a cup into a gallon of water and use that. <clears throat> When we say we want disinfection to be efficient, what we mean by that is you need to disinfect the right surfaces. So we want to focus on surfaces and objects that are frequently touched by people. So spaces, that's going to be doorknobs, light switch, um, shared phone, and handles in bathrooms, tabletops, countertops, controls. Think of things like um, grocery stores, it would be keypads and the things that we're all touching. Um, there are many surfaces that do not need to be disinfected. So we do not need to worry about disinfecting surfaces that aren't frequently touched or aren't touched at all, like ceilings or floors, um, sidewalks, ground covers. Um, I've, we've gotten questions mulch and sand that um, uses of disinfectant very low risk. Um, and the disinfect anyway, disinfectant uh, and effort. And that areas that have closed for there for seven days, if there was any virus. Cleaning is fine. Disinfection to be disinfectant should be used at the creation. Uh, it's important to keep all this I'm there. I think I think you've uh Amy, Amy, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. I can okay, hear I you, think, yeah. I think we got caught up on the sound. Let me okay. see. Apologize for that. 
Uh, we have sound coming in and out, and I, I know you're almost done, but uh, uh, the, the slide that says COVID-19 disinfect, if you could start from that slide over again, I think that would help everybody. Oh, we just- Sure, okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, thanks. I okay. can hear you now. I think I think we got caught up on the sound. Great, which which slide did you want me to start with? Um, the one that you're on, uh, COVID-19 disinfect with the right protection. Um, go ahead and, and if you could start with that one again. Thank you. Great. Okay, will do. Um, yes, so as I was saying um, that you guys couldn't hear, uh, we want to be sure that your cleaning and disinfection is safe. Um, and by that, we mean disinfect with the right protection. Um, so your staff should be instructed on how to apply the disinfectants according to the label. We want to ensure that disinfectants are used at the correct concentration. Um, so the co concentration that is on the label is what we know is effective for the virus. We don't want to go any higher than that because that can um, add additional health risks um, for using those disinfectants. So again, this is not a case where if a little is good, more is better. Um, you also want to use the personal protective equipment uh, that's uh, recommended from the manufacturer's instructions. Ensure that you have sufficient ventilation for the disinfectants that are used. It's really important to keep disinfectants out of reach of children, both when they're in use and when they're in storage, um, and to store the disinfectants appropriately. Okay, and with that, I just wanted to leave you with some CDC resources that might be useful. Um, and again, don't bother writing these down, we will provide them to you. Um, the latest COVID-19 information is just at that cdc.gov slash coronavirus. You can find all of this there, um, but just so you know what to look for. Um, the cleaning and disinfection guidance is here, um, and that includes all of the things I talked about today uh, with some more detail um, on specific, um, specific recommendations for certain workplaces. Um, guidance for workplaces in general, so how to reopen a business um, in uh, this, in a way that is uh, safe uh, for COVID-19. General COVID prevention, so the things that you can do to protect yourself from others is found here. Um, hand washing information, uh, we have lots of great information about hand washing. There's also a page on face coverings, including how to make one uh, for yourself, um, if you uh, want to make one yourself. Um, and then lastly, I've provided a link to CDC communication resources. So we have all kinds of posters and social media, um, and graphics that you can use to help get these messages out um, to the people in your communities. So if you want posters that you can put up about hand washing or social distancing um, or appropriate disinfection, you can find um, all of those things and more um, at that bottom link. And with that, I will end and turn it back over to Michael. Thank, thank you, Amy. Uh, for everybody else, um, I know we had a little bit of um, uh, audio problems. Uh, keep in mind, we have um, uh, thousands of people on this webinar and some of our presenters are actually at their home because of sheltering in place orders. So just bear with us and we'll make sure that we get to everybody. And, and I am looking at your questions to give them. Um, so uh, Christy, you're self muted. If you could unmute yourself and we will make you the presenter because you will go next. Okay, Christy, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Great. Thank you, Michael. I'd like to first thank our host, HUD's Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Homes for providing us this opportunity today to share information with property managers and maintenance staff of multifamily housing properties about this critically important topic. So thank you. I'm delighted to share this panel also with the experts from CDC and the Washington State Department of Health, multifamily housing with HUD has been relying on the guidance from CDC and local public health departments as we navigate this unprecedented situation. So multifamily housing publishes guidance for COVID-19 on the HUD.gov website in the form of questions and answers. You can find the Q&As on the multifamily housing website at the link on this slide, and these slides will be shared. In our guidance, multifamily consistently directs the owners and agents of multifamily housing properties to the experts when it comes to dealing with this infectious disease. So first, we direct multifamily owners and agents to communicate with their local health department if they're concerned that residents or staff might have COVID-19. 
and we direct them to generally follow CDC guidelines and the directions given by local health officials for emergency preparedness for infectious diseases and for cleaning and disinfecting, among other topics. On cleaning and disinfecting specifically, we direct property owners to the CDC website, Environmental Cleaning and Disinfection Recommendations. The link is included here, which provides recommendations on the cleaning and disinfecting, like Amy mentioned in some of her slides too, of rooms and areas of those with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients have visited. And we direct them to the CDC website, Disinfecting Your Facility If Someone Is Sick, which was also covered by Amy. In addition, multifamily housing recently published relevant guidance on best practices in medical waste disposal on the HUD Exchange website. Medical waste refers to healthcare waste that may be contaminated with blood, bodily fluid, or other potentially infectious materials. It also includes waste associated with treatment of infectious diseases at home or in a healthcare setting. So you can find a link to the flyer, Medical Waste Disposal Best Practices for Owners of Multifamily Properties on this slide. We did receive a question from one of the webinar attendees about whether or not owners and agents can notify residents, workers, volunteers, and staff if there is a known COVID-19 infection in a building. So we wanted to provide you the answer with that question. So the answer is that you can, but you must not provide the name or apartment number or any other personally identifiable information. According to guidance from the CDC that had received, owners and agents should maintain confidentiality as required by the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, otherwise known as HIPAA. Further, we suggest that messages should attempt to, to counter any potential stigma and discrimination. And note, if you want to add some additional detail about this point, there's a CDC link listed. CDC also offered some ideas about how to do this. You can place signage in common areas and entrances or exits and send a letter to all residents. Make sure that any educational materials and information are provided for non-English speakers and low literacy persons as well. To support owners and agents in responding to the coronavirus outbreak, multifamily housing published guidance on what emergency funds Owners and agents can access for expenses such as extra supplies, additional administrative hours, and staff overtime. Multifamily property owners and agents can access property operating accounts for all reasonable and necessary COVID-19 related preparedness and response actions. So no advanced HUD approval is required to access those operating account funds for those uses. To the extent that owner advances are needed from your reserve for replacement or residual receipt accounts, Owners should contact their county executive at HUD to request HUD approval in advance. For those properties with reserve for replacement accounts and residual receipts accounts, funds should still be accessed according to current policy in Handbook 4350.1 Chapter 4 for reserve for replacement accounts and Chapter 25 for residual receipts accounts for eligible items. If the owner is seeking to use for replacement and residual receipts funds for non-eligible uses. Approval must be received from Hudfield staff and headquarters as necessary in advance. So those are items to keep in mind. And that is all from me, Michael, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, let me go ahead and switch to our third presenter. Again, for everybody, um, I think we got most of the sound issues uh, figured out. Uh, Nancy, uh, you're up. Let me make you the panelist. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you all right. You're ready to go. Go ahead and accept the um, invitation. To, there you go. We can see everything now. Thanks. All right. We can, see, we can see your screen. Uh, while, while you're getting up your PowerPoint presentation, um, I just want to make everybody aware because there's a couple of questions coming in. Uh, we are recording this webinar. And if there is a little bit of sound trouble, um, just be patient because we'll get it caught up. Um, and uh, at the end of Nancy's presentation, I will be taking the questions you've been asking and try to get as many as I can in uh, to the presenters. So without further delay, Nancy, uh, we're looking forward to seeing your presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right, thank you. I'm Nancy Bernard uh, at, from the Washington State Department of Health. And I've been teaching for years, primarily with school um, 
custodial and facility people, school nurses, and local health jurisdictions on cleaning and disinfecting. And so I'm going to add a bit, I hope, and not overlap with the um, CDC presentation. So one of the things I keep telling people with COVID-19 is this isn't new that we're dealing with a respiratory virus. It's a new virus. There's some new twists to this virus, but we do, we've been doing public health for a very long time. We have um, several ways that germs can spread. Foodborne and waterborne are two that get a lot of attention at the local, state, and federal health department levels with lots of regulations. Um, we're going to deal more um, today with the person-to-person, -person, um, the droplet transmission, which is primarily what COVID-19 appears to be, although you may hear, um, depending on how closely you watch the news, um, arguments over airborne versus droplet. But for our purposes, it's that six foot separation. And then the contaminated surfaces where people can pick up um, viruses. If you keep reading the information, the droplet transmission is considered the primary means of transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So again, this is not a new slide for me. We've been, I've been doing this slide for many, many years. Um, hopefully now people are really getting that message. Wash your hands with plain soap and water often. Cover your cough and sneeze. Don't touch your eyes, nose, and mouth. If you've touched a surface, do not assume that it's clean or sterile or disinfected. Yes, we're doing a lot more surface disinfecting now. But as soon as somebody comes by who is um, coughing, sneezing, or just talking and is infected, it can become contaminated quite rapidly. So my mantra is just don't assume that any surface that you touch is sterile. And don't touch your eyes, nose, and mouth unless you've just washed your hands. Get your vaccinations. That's going to become really important this fall when flu starts circulating again and maintain really good ventilation. Dilution helps a great deal when it comes to respiratory um, viruses. There's just still a lot of research going on about this particular virus, but in general, the more outside air, the better for your um, areas, communal areas. If you can increase that outside ventilation, that will help. And obviously stay home when you're sick and support public health. Soap is really important, particularly with COVID-19, because if you've seen some of these articles, we know that soap actually breaks apart lipid envelope viruses, which influenza and COVID-19 are both two types of viruses that have these lipid envelopes. So soap with enough contact time itself will deactivate or kill this virus. Scrub for 20 seconds and you do not need antibacterial soaps. They're completely unnecessary. They can be bad for human health and bad for the environment. We don't care if organisms are living or dead when we wash them down the sink. And in general, antibacterial soaps are not going to kill viruses and they don't kill a lot of bacteria, to tell you the truth. Hand sanitizers, you've heard a lot about that. They really are not a substitute for hand washing. They are not effective on dirty hands. So if you have dirty hands, you really need to find a sink with soap and warm water and hopefully paper towels. If you do use the hand sanitizer because you can't get hold of a sink, make sure you use enough of it that you're going to penetrate the mucus that protects viruses or else it can't kill them. They are not effective on non-envelope viruses like norovirus. Most people are familiar now with norovirus. It's um, very prolific, causes a great deal of disability, um, and hand sanitizer is not going to work. You need hand washing. Alcohol is a flammable poison. It must be kept out of the reach of children and be um, careful with it. It should be fragrance free. Over 30% of people now are fragrance sensitive and you want people to use these products so don't include the fragrances. Non-alcohol hand sanitizers are not recommended. That's just period. They are not. Um, this won't be in your PDF because I don't know where it came from. My nephew sent it to me because they know how I feel 
about hand washing. So sinks, it is time that we put more sinks. Um, I was at a market the other day that has a um, pet petting zoo, um, obviously not supposed to be used right now, but they had installed a sink with hand washing. We need more ability to do public hand washing. I work a lot with schools and you're seeing sinks now in cafeterias and gyms. Hand dryers are um, popular in some circles, but they can spread germs around if people haven't washed them off their hands. And then you don't have that paper towel to open doors. And I personally never assume a door handle has been disinfected properly. I love my paper towels. And then I take them and I put them in my yard waste for composting. So I've told you I work with schools. There's a lot of organisms we deal with. Influenza, measles, and pertussis are all circulating now. They're all vaccine preventable. We hope COVID-19 will um, eventually be vaccine presentable, preventable. MRSA is a skin organism. So if you're um, operating communal areas, um, gyms and such, you know about cleaning and probably disinfecting disinfecting any surfaces with skin contact to prevent the organisms that are transferred skin to skin. COVID is not one of them. This is a respiratory virus. It doesn't penetrate the skin. Norovirus, we've talked about that. Anywhere there's feces or vomit, that's got to be cleaned and disinfected, and that takes a higher level of disinfectant. And so too does the um, C. difficile, which don't expect you'd be dealing with. So a lot of times we talk about how hard it is to kill organisms. This is just for reference and to let you know the lipid envelope viruses like influenza and COVID-19 are the easiest to kill. So survivability of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, it may float in the air for about three hours. How long um, and how much of the virus is um, ability has an ability to cause infection is still to be determined. This is all preliminary studies. It can live on surfaces for up to three days, which is why if your building or facility has been closed for seven days, um, the guidance is not to disinfect. It's not necessary. Um, we don't know how much of the virus is staying really viable for three days. There's still a lot more to know, but that's the number we're going with right now. On copper, um, copper does kill organisms. We've known that for thousands of years, and but we don't have a lot of copper surfaces. And cardboard, it doesn't live long on paper. It dries out and starts to die on paper. So clean, sanitize, disinfect. We've talked about that already. I'm just gonna hit some highlights. Um, one of the things uh, we'd like is to see products used that don't cause asthma, don't cause people to develop asthma, and don't trigger asthma attacks. One out of 10 children in our country on average have asthma, and a lot of adults have asthma. Um, workers, acquire asthma frequently from disinfectants, in particular bleach and the quaternary ammonia disinfectants. So um, all of these types of ingredients you might be using in your facilities can cause work-related asthma. And sprays, we don't want sprays, we don't want plug-ins, we don't want scented candles, pup purries, essential oils, et cetera. All of these can cause or trigger asthma and they do nothing for human health or the environment. You want to um, ventilate adequately, change your air filters. If you can improve your air filtration, if you have mechanical ventilation to a MERV 13, that's the new recommendation, particularly in areas with traffic related air pollutants and wood smoke. Air fresheners are never safe for human health clean has no scent. So this is a program from California. This is specific to schools, but they have a whole work-related asthma prevention program where you can get more guidance. Green cleaning. We recommend green cleaning. 
you always clean before you disinfect. Remember, cleaning will remove most germs and microorganisms, and unless you remove the organic matter, your disinfectants and sanitizers won't work. But there's, and here's another reason to use green cleaners. They produce a lot less of the volatile organic compounds that can cause um, health problems, sensitizations, asthma, headaches, etc. But you want to be really careful. There's a great deal of greenwashing, just like right now, there's a lot of products being marketed to businesses and schools and people that do not really do what they claim to do. So always read labels front and back, read the safety data sheet, read the product data sheet. They should all agree. If you're looking for anything besides disinfectants and sanitizers, which are have to be EPA registered products, you go for the third party certification, Green Seal, UOL Eco Logo, and the EPA Safer Choice programs. That's for all your products that you might be using except sanitizers and disinfectants. So here's another slide just to remind you, cleaning, that's first and foremost, the most important thing to do. Then you apply your disinfectant and follow the label. And we're gonna talk about a safer disinfection program. Well ventilated space, you must have a safety data sheet. That's required by law. That's why we tell schools to not allow parents, teachers, and staff to supply their own chemicals. For keyboards and sensitive electronics, I recommend alcohol wipes. You can either have a bottle of 70% or more al isopropyl alcohol that you spray into a cloth to wipe down surfaces or use the alcohol wipes. And then it's best that people just not assume that any surfaces they touch are really um, sterile and not touch their faces. So EPA does have a program for safer disinfectants. So they register sanitizers and disinfectants based on how effective they are at killing certain types of organisms. And there's lots of classifications. And as you've already seen for COVID-19, it's the end list of um, products that they've not been tested against SARS-CoV-2. It's too soon for that, but they're considered able to kill SARS-CoV-2 because they're registered to kill organisms that are harder to kill than coronaviruses. So when you're picking your disinfectants, there's a lot of information out there. Um, this is about types of disinfectants and their efficacy. So when we make recommendations, this is the kind of data that I use. If you notice the quads, which I'm recommending people move away from because there are asthmogens, they're also um, reproductive, can cause reproductive problems, they're endocrine disruptors, skin sensitizers, they're also very low level um, disinfectants. I'm mostly recommending people consider the hydrogen peroxides and the alcohol products. So this is a study done in 2014. It was done before some of the alcohol-based disinfectants were on the market, but it's a really good um, source of information evaluating disinfectants if you're interested. EPA's design for the environment is a a program for there's antimicrobial pesticides, and that's what sanitizers and disinfectants are. They're EPA registered antimicrobial pesticides. The Design for the Environment program um, is for designating safer disinfectants. So that will include disinfectants based on these products, hydrogen peroxide, lactic and citric acid, and alcohol, either ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. The products that may cause asthma, the quaternary ammonia compounds, there's four primary ones, we call them quats for short, bleach, acetic acid, thymol, glutaraldehyde, and periacetic acid all can cause asthma. Um, here's two resources. Um, the PDFs are posted to the website or you can download them from these um, websites on choosing safer disinfectants. 
Bleach, just to be clear, is a disinfectant or a sanitizer. It is not a cleaner. So you have to clean the surface first if you use bleach. Never mix it with ammonia or acid products. Always have ventilation. And in my state, and I suspect most states, you are required to have an emergency eye wash if you mix it from concentrate. I did want to mention wipes. You can get safer wipes. So you can get, if you really want to use wipes, you can get HP and alcohol-based wipes. The traditional wipes have all been quats, and those are the ones that would be a good idea to move away from if you can. So high touch surfaces have already been mentioned. Always try and have, actually the building codes require warm water for hand washing, but if people can't mix cold and hot water to get the temperature they like, make sure they're getting temperatures somewhere between 90 and 100 degrees, so it's not too hot or too cold to wash your hands properly. Some special concerns in public places, you should not use cake deodorizers like paradiochlorbenzene or um, naphthalene. Be very careful with terpene-based products. My general recommendation is to be careful with any of your botanical-based products because they tend to be very sensitizing and people start to react to them. Nano silver should not be used in the general environment. It's not good for, um, for the environment. Remember, everything you use goes down the drain. Air fresheners don't freshen the air. They put a lot of chemicals in there that stick to everything and can cause respiratory problems, eye irritation, migraines. Do not use ozone generators. I know it's, um, we've been saying that for years in indoor air quality. Ozone is a respiratory irritant. It can trigger asthma. It's not going to kill your COVID-19, at least not at these levels that you can use safely. Try to use no fragrance products and do not use antibacterial products. Um, here's a little more information on fragrances. If you're interested in a toolkit, this is the thing I get the most complaints about from schools and public places. Um, and microfiber cloths. If you can switch to cleaning with microfiber cloths, um, you can clean a lot more efficiently with less chemical, less effort. They um, can be washed and dried, and you can have color coded to avoid cross contamination. And do not fog. Um, EPA is not registering, as in general, products to fog for COVID-19. There may be some specific uses in hospitals. That's not an area I work in, but in schools and public places, there is no call for spraying chemical into the air. All surfaces do not need to be disinfected to prevent transmission of this disease. We're working on the high touch surfaces where people can touch them and then deliver the virus to their eyes, nose, and mouth. And remember the primary means of transmission is you know being too close to somebody who's infected, which is why the six foot separation. Here's some resources that might be of help to you and my contact information. And remember there should be somebody at most of your health departments also that can help you. Thank you. No problem. Um, you can hear me okay right now. I can. Correct? Okay, and again, uh, to everybody, I, I let Nancy go over a little bit of time because I know we had some uh, some uh, sound problems. And I apologize. The recording that we're making actually will turn out to be really good. It will not have those situations. Um, so I'm unmuting all three of our presenters, Amy, Christy. Uh, Christy, you're actually self-muted, so if you could unmute. Um, and then I'm going to keep Nancy on. Um, so we do have some uh, a little bit of time for questions. Uh, Okay, so Christy, you're uh, up. So let me just uh, ask you some of the questions that came in. Some of them you actually covered by your presentation. Um, I do wanna remind people too that we are recording and the handouts and the PowerPoint presentations will be available for you. Um, so the first question that came up is, um, uh, are we required uh, to provide and pay for disinfecting individuals' homes of residents that have been confirmed COVID-19? If so, what level of cleaning are we required to provide? I know you you covered that, but I think the question is, um, a, a couple of questions that have come in, actually quite a few about, define frequently when you say hand washing or cleaning, what you would mean by that.
I think that was for CDC. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was for Nancy. Um, yeah, so frequently, um, we don't have a set time. Um, it's as often as possible and based on what you are doing. Um, so there are certainly key times for hand washing, um, but after you cough or sneeze or blow your nose, um, before you prepare or serve or eat food, um, after going to the bathroom, after diaper changing, um, things like that. But also now, if you have been um, out shopping and you are coming back home, we recommend that you wash your hands when you get home. Um, so there are uh, key times for that and no set number. Um, cleaning and disinfecting is similar. Um, we would like to see these uh, frequently touched surfaces cleaned at least daily. Um, but the more frequent they can be cleaned, the better off they are, especially something that is touched a lot um, by a lot of different people. So those are the places that you should concentrate and clean them uh, and disinfect them as frequently as you can. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the other question, I think we'll take four questions. Um, so I appreciate everybody's patience. Uh, the next question is, is there any need to disinfect one's shoes after walking around in a public area, uh, such as um, the commons area in, in one of the facilities? So we are not recommending that people clean and disinfect their shoes. Um, again, the, the likelihood of contamination on the ground in a public space is relatively low and the likelihood of transmission um, to a person from a shoe is also very low. Um, so that is not somewhere, if we're thinking about efficient use of disinfection, that's not a high risk surface. Um, so we're not recommending uh, cleaning and disinfection of shoes specifically for COVID. Okay, thank you for that answer. Um, I think we'll take two more questions. Um, uh, so uh, let's see here. I'm skipping through the sound questions. Um, so could you all address, I know what you touched on a little bit, but uh, we're getting a lot of questions on, on fogging uh, for disinfecting. Could you um, talk a little bit about whether it's recommended or not again? So CDC defers to EPA on application methods. Um, to my knowledge, there are no um, foggers that are on list in, um, and that's what we would uh, refer to. Fogging is not um, the most efficient method for disinfection because of the need for contact time. Um, and there are also concerns with uh, health risk. Um, fogging is, is, a, is a much riskier way to disinfect a room. Um, so uh, we would really prefer that you use the, the list in disinfectants with the application method that they're approved for. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. Um, we'll take one more question, and this is also, again, a question that came up pretty frequently uh, from attendees, um, which was um, um, visitors to the housing complex um, required to wear masks or not, and, and how far should they go in um, making that a requirement? And a couple of people even said that they have pregnant um, uh, individuals in their apartments and, and just need a clarification on um, visitors wearing masks. So just to make sure I understand the question, this is visitors into homes or into public spaces? Uh, I think the question came in as both on different questions. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you have um, visitors coming into the facility, they should be wearing, uh, they should be encouraged to wear face coverings um, so that they're protecting your um, residents. Uh, certainly if they're coming within, you know, six feet of a resident, if they are only doing exterior work like landscaping and they're not going to come in close contact with a resident, a face covering uh, may not be necessary if they're able to stay far enough away. Um, but certainly if they're going into residents' homes and they may be um, coming into close contact with residents, even if only um, for a short time, face coverings would be recommended. Um, we are not recommending that people require face coverings because there are people that cannot wear them um, because it's difficult to breathe or for any number of other reasons. Um, so just please keep in mind that while it is a universal recommendation, um, there are people that cannot meet that recommendation. Um, and there are other ways, um, like keeping people more than six feet apart, um, that can be used in place of face coverings where they're not possible. 
Okay, uh, very good answers. Okay, so um, in order to save everybody's time, because I know we're a little bit over, I just want to take this opportunity to thank our three presenters, uh, Nancy, uh, Amy, and uh, Christy for a wonderful presentation. Um, I do want to remind everybody before we close this webinar that we have been recording the webinar. Sometimes the recording has a lot better sound because it has to do with so many people trying to hear at the same time. Um, the recording will be posted, and when you get an email tomorrow, you'll be getting an email as to the location to uh, get the recording and any of the handouts that we've presented for you today. So on behalf of HUD, CDC, and our presenters and the National Health Network,